two covered mule-drawn wagons, eight Union soldiers on horseback, clad in dirt-covered blue uniforms. They are weary and tired from the long journey. Even the mules, dehydrated and limping, weighed down by the formidable load of the wagons they pull behind them, are on the verge of collapse. Worst of all, there's no telling just how many excruciating hours or days remain until they reach their destination. Because they are lost. The party had plotted its route carefully to avoid enemy forces. It's the summer of 1863, and Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his army have invaded Pennsylvania, after all. But somewhere in the so-called Wild Cat Country, what locals called this rugged, lightly charted part of the forest north of the Cinnamahoning River, they had gone off course. Either the crudely drawn maps themselves were wrong, or, more likely, the sleep-deprived soldiers failed to properly follow them. Now, having thrown all caution to the wind, they meander aimlessly, desperate for some recognizable marker of human civilization. At least the enemy might hold them as prisoners and show some mercy. But the wilderness will do no such favors. Food rations are dwindling. A certain end awaits. All the men are in horrendous shape, but none among them is worse off than their leader, the sorry lieutenant. He sits drooped over his horse, tied into his stirrups so as not to fall off, his muscles too weak to keep him in place using their force alone. On top of the hunger and fatigue, he is suffering from a fever. Without medical attention and soon, his days are numbered. We must keep going, he growls over the latest objection from an underling. He knows something the rest of the men do not. Hidden beneath the creaky wooden boards of the two wagons, in a pair of false bottom compartments, sit 26 massive brick-shaped bars of government gold. They lack the typical shine, painted black for camouflage. Each one weighs nearly 50 pounds. Valued at roughly $900 an ounce using today's prices, each bar is worth well over half a million. But this journey means far more than financial gain. Rather, it is a matter of patriotic duty. President Lincoln himself has tasked the lieutenant with a secret mission, the delivery of the ingots from a government stockpile in West Virginia east to Philadelphia. If the gold doesn't make it to the U.S. Mint there soon, the Union might run out of funds to finance the war effort. The unit's second in command, oblivious to this, has had enough. He convinces the lieutenant, at this point realizing he must concede in order to avoid a mutiny, to allow him and one other man to split off into a nimbler detachment to ride in search of help. They take the two best horses and head south through the brush. Upon return, newly fed and accompanied by a rescue party, they retrace their steps to the spot where they separated from the main group. Just a few miles from there, they find the wagons. No sign of the men, nor the animals. After further examination, something appears amiss. The floors of the two wagons have seemingly been removed, revealing what look to be hidden compartments. Only, they are completely empty. Two summers later, after the war's conclusion, a pair of government detectives come back to the area in search of the missing gold. Eventually, they discover two of the lost bars buried under a pine stump. They continue to search nearby, but can find no sign of the remaining 24 bars. 
Clearly, the gold has been divided. They do find one thing, however. Several human skeletons. Elk County, Pennsylvania, mid-2010s. The forest, somewhere in the vicinity of Dents Run. Two treasure hunters stumble upon something unusual. They are a father-son duo, well familiar with the legend of the lost Civil War gold, as well as all sorts of folk tales local to this isolated part of central Pennsylvania. The father, Dennis Parada, and his son, Kem, have gone through this neck of the woods many times before. Hundreds, in fact. Despite the intense summer heat, they are clad in long-sleeved clothing because they care more about keeping the insects off. Boots and gloves, too. The job requires trudging through mud and getting their hands dirty. The pair calls themselves Finders Keepers, and they are a self-proclaimed treasure hunting company. Skeptics, though, might describe them as delusional hobbyists rather than any legitimate business. This time, they are examining the inside of a small cave, which seems promising. The clue came via a strange mark on a tree nearby, which had to be some type of code. Now the metal detector is going crazy. There's something down there. Given the location and strength of the device's signal, the men have a hunch to what that something is. Knowing that their amateur tools alone won't be enough to determine if the gold is really buried below, and perhaps hoping to earn for themselves a finder's fee, they compile evidence and contact the FBI. Pretty soon, the federal agency sends a team out to the area to investigate. Before doing any digging, the FBI wants to conduct a geological survey on the site to determine if the treasure hunters are really onto something. The Bureau has contracted a specialized consulting firm called EnviroScan to do this work for them. The consultants bring with them something called a gravimeter. With its cubic shape and numerical buttons, it looks like some bizarre alien toaster. But don't be fooled. This is a precise scientific instrument, able to identify the density of objects in the ground and in doing so, roughly approximate their specific chemical composition. A man plants the device in the ground at the precise spot where the Parada's metal detectors had gone off. A few moments later, he reads a bit of the output on the display and nods with excitement. There's something down there, all right. A large metallic mass its characteristics, sure enough, consistent with gold. The only thing left now is to pull it out. It's 2018 now, and the FBI is preparing to extricate the mysterious underground cache. They have set up camp and brought in several dozen agents, all wearing matching navy blue jackets, as well as a yellow backhoe. Dennis and Kem thought they persuaded their contact at the federal agency to allow them to watch the excavation. Pretty soon, however, that initial enthusiasm fades as they realize the agents on the ground have no such intention. The treasure hunters are forced to stay in their car for most of the first day, out of view from the dig site. As the late afternoon rolls around, an agent approaches and explains that the operation will be put on pause. Although only three feet from the reported depth of the object picked up by the scans, it will soon be dark and the agents are getting tired. They will start again in the morning. The Paradas are made to go home. On the second day, the pair returns bright and early, hoping to finally get a glimpse of the fabled treasure. Again, the FBI tells them to stay in the car but their confinement doesn't last so long this time. Just a few hours later, the same agent as the day before escorts them along a snow-covered path through the trees to the familiar location of the cave. 
They step inside, crouching a bit as not to bump their heads. What awaits? Not the expected golden bars, but instead only an empty hole in the ground. The FBI has found nothing. The federal agents pack up their campsite and depart. The Paradas return home, dejected. There has to be more to the story. Something doesn't add up. Finders Keeper's instruments, although far from the high-fangled $100,000 devices of EnviroScan, are reliable, and they had indicated some sort of metal object buried in the cave. The father-son duo cannot accept that it was just dirt. Deeply suspicious, and knowing that the FBI won't give much more than that same canned official response, the Paradas begin to ask around. They go door to door in the vicinity of the dig site, introducing themselves to the few neighbors there are and seeing if they have witnessed anything out of the ordinary. It turns out most have. One woman swears by having heard noises of heavy machinery overnight, a time the FBI was not supposed to have been digging. You could hear the noise and I was like, and I looked in that whole hillside, I said, it was so bright. They had the biggest lights out there. What sounded like a jackhammer. She couldn't forget it. She had work early the next morning after all, and the ruckus kept her from sleeping. Another neighbor, from the somewhat elevated vantage point of his front porch, had noticed strange vehicles on the base of the hill near the site the Paradas were asking about. Curious, he pulled out his binoculars and began to watch. He saw three small single rider ATVs emerging from the tree line and driving up to a couple of SUVs pulled up nearby. Then the men parked, got up from their vehicles and seemed to begin loading something from the ATVs onto the SUVs. A third woman readying her kids for school recalls seeing a few armored trucks drive past, part of a much longer convoy of FBI vehicles. All of these accounts only confirm Dennis and Kem's distrust of what they have been told. None of the details make sense. The FBI, they figure, did find the gold, and for some reason, is denying it. Mike, thank you. Other headlines today. Do you remember this? It was three years ago this month, actually, where a remote woodland site in Elk County was the scene of a major excavation effort. However, back then, nobody really knew what these FBI agents were looking for. That until now. Finders Keepers eventually file a Freedom of Information suit, hoping to compel the FBI to reveal whatever information they have pertaining to the dig. The agency says it has nothing to share. A lawyer for Finders Keepers reaches out to U.S. Senator Pat Toomey for help. The Justice Department orders the FBI to conduct a more thorough review. Eventually, the FBI admits to having roughly 2,400 documents pertaining to the case, as well as videos. However, releasing them will take several years. Unsatisfied, the treasure hunters and their legal team successfully sue a Pennsylvania state agency, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, to reveal its communications with the FBI regarding the search for gold. The resulting emails are especially illuminating. A 2018 one marked Confidential, written by K.T. Newton, an assistant U.S. attorney in Philadelphia, states that, we believe the cache itself is in the neighborhood of 3 by 5 by 8 feet to 5 by 5 by 8 feet. Sure enough, it seems, the FBI did expect to find gold in Dent's Run. Eventually, journalists who have caught wind of the case petition a federal judge to unseal documents related to the FBI's preemptive 2018 application for a warrant permitting seizure of the gold. The affidavit reveals even more. In it, Jacob Archer of the FBI's art crime team in Philadelphia asserts 
that the Elk County site contains gold belonging to the federal government. I have probable cause to believe that a significant cache of gold is secreted in the underground cave, it reads, one or more tons. Most recently, the FBI claims it possesses 17 videos related to the excavation. But upon a court order to release the videos, the agency can produce only four. And it turns out, these videos are not new, but the exact ones initially provided by Finders Keepers as evidence at the time it first reached out to the FBI. What happened to the remaining 13 videos? Did the FBI simply misstate the number to a federal judge? Or had the additional videos truly been filmed, only to have been hidden or deleted? Dennis and Kem Parada continue to press for answers. There was something here, something here of value, some kind of precious metal, and whatever it is, it was go it's gone now. And that's what I want to get to the bottom of is what was in that hole. But to this day, the FBI denies finding any gold in Elk County. Rather than any sort of definitive conclusion to the legend of the Civil War gold, it seems this episode has only added yet another mysterious chapter. Despite the forced release of documents pertaining to the surreptitious dig at Den's Run, many questions remain. Was there ever really any gold at all? What happened to the missing soldiers? What did the Parada's metal detectors first pick up on in that cave? Whether or not the FBI found anything, why go to such great lengths to deny it and withhold information? Will we ever know? All of this, like the location of the gold itself, eludes a satisfactory answer. Who knows? Maybe it's still out there.